Boys like Lenny Kuje were supposed to have been the future of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. Educated at an elite German music school, Lenny was a member of the Hitler Youth and was even trained to support Hitler's SS troops at the end of World War II. But Hitler's defeat changed everything. Lenny became a war refugee at the age of 12 and was taken in by the same American soldiers he was taught to fight. In a refugee camp, he discovered something unexpected, something that would change his life. And they took me to this little guardhouse. It was sunny, but cold. It was May, I guess. And they had a fire going in one of those big old oil drums. And the radio was playing. And there was ba ba doo 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 ba doo 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 That was it. Inspired by American jazz legend Lionel Hampton, Lenny went on to become a jazz musician in the United States, playing in Washington, D.C. clubs and eventually for a jazz-loving president. But his musical journey began in Nazi Germany. Some of my friends now, you know, would kid me uh, when they said, what would Adolf think if you know he became a bebopper, a stone bebopper? I said, he'd turn around in his grave, you know. Yeah, total... <laughs> total disappointment to the Third Reich. Jazz had been banned by the Nazis because it was considered subversive and decadent, the product of so-called inferior races. It was this forbidden music that became forever linked in Lenny's mind with the liberation of Germany. Inspired by Lionel Hampton, he was determined to play jazz. It was something that apparently I was waiting for, you know after Hitler Youth and lining up and, and marching in step and, and singing tunes that I didn't like and etc etc to finally have something that makes you just jump up and scream and say yeah <laughs> all right at the age of 72 Lenny lives in Arlington Virginia and plays jazz each week in a Baltimore hotel Jazz altered his life, and the music helped him reject the indoctrination of his childhood. It meant the end of marching in time and a departure from classical music. It was the beginning of improvisation and a life transformed by American jazz. Before Lenny left Germany, Details about the Holocaust began to emerge. Lenny and his classmates at the German music school had been sheltered from the realities of concentration camps. First I thought it was propaganda. Against Germany? Yeah, I said that the Allies, I mean, making that up, you know, in order to, because uh, I don't, I said, I don't think anybody could have done anything like that, you know. And then the Nuremberg trials came. Well, that's when you found out, you know, and by that time, I was so mad at the Germans for what, you know, I mean, they lied to me. Disillusioned with Germany, Lenny embraced American culture. I learned GI English, just baseball, it's a whole other story, and I wouldn't even speak German anymore. A relative living in the United States helped arrange a visa, and Lenny left Germany at the age of 15. He arrived in New York on January 13, 1950, one of his first stops was the Apollo Theater, where he saw Lionel Hampton. It felt like I've come to, to, to heaven, to paradise, you know. But some aspects of American life surprised Lenny. Lionel Hampton was among the first jazz musicians to play in an integrated band. But American society remained segregated, and racial tension was on the rise. Oh, no, it was a very great big disappointment. I mean, uh, but I didn't want to believe it as such, because I came from a huge disappointment of the Third Reich, you know, to a, a dream of, of freedom and jazz and baseball. Lenny moved to Arlington, Virginia with relatives and went to Washington and Lee High School. He was in for another surprise. Jazz was not popular with his Arlington classmates. You know, but I said, wait a minute, they're all talking about red sails in the sunset or candy kisses wrapped in paper, you know. Where's the bebop? <laughs> you know. So in Washington Lee, I mean, those kids were square. 
They still are. <laughs> Lenny made friends with a schoolmate named Pat Conti, who shared his interest in jazz. The two became friends for life. School was dull. Uh, they didn't like jazz music. It was the devil's music. We couldn't play jazz at the school. And um, so we played in, you saw that picture downstairs, from my basement. <laughs> that's, that's where we started. And we started playing. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. After graduating from Washington and Lee High School in 1952, Lenny was drafted into the U.S. Air Force. He served until 1956 and then went to study music in Johnson City, Tennessee. In 1960, he returned to Washington and became part of D.C.'s U Street jazz scene, playing in clubs like the Bohemian Caverns and Republic Gardens. He earned the nickname Snowflake while playing with black musicians, and he risked fines from segregated unions when he crossed the color line. And at that time, uh, you know, you were called sort of a, a, a nigger lover. That was the word. I even was fined from the American Musicians Union here. There were two. There was the 710, the black union, and the white. I was fined $250 for playing for the black scale because I had all black guys in my band, you know. Lenny's life took him in many directions. He moved to New York in 1963 and continued playing jazz. But a sense of loneliness and disappointment followed him wherever he went. Alcohol and drugs entered the picture, and before long, he faced a serious addiction. He even stopped playing jazz. The idea of wanting to play some more made me want to live, you know, and made me make changes that made me want to be well, healthy. You know, do phraseology. Yeah, it's, but it's a flying home rhythm. Lenny returned to Washington and has been playing in the area since 1979. A pianist named Michael Wilner entered Lenny's life, and the two discovered they had a strange connection. As I got to know Lenny, he began to share his background with me and, uh, you know, tell me stories about his childhood and during Nazi Germany and things that happened to him during the war. And, uh, but uh, it wasn't really clear the connection until uh, my mother came one evening to see him and they began to talk and uh, it became clear that uh, there was some tremendous coincidence in their two backgrounds. Like Lenny, Michael's mother had grown up in Europe during World War II, but the circumstances of her childhood were much different. I was born in 1941 in Poland and um, I was a hidden child, a child survivor of the Holocaust. Um, I was hidden in a secret uh, space, crawl space, in a concentration camp, which was really a labor slave camp, in Poland. Members of the Wilner family survived and made their way on foot to a refugee camp in Ulm, Germany, after the end of World War II. Right around the same time, Lenny was headed in the same direction as a child refugee. Who knows whether our paths crossed or not. I mean, the world is so full of these weird coincidences, but the point is we were at the same place at the same time coming from opposite directions. Their paths would cross much later in Washington, D.C., when Carol was a student at George Washington University. And that's when I first encountered Lenny as a jazz musician, and that was at the uh, Bohemian caverns and, you know, some of the other jazz places, because I love jazz, and I hung around with the hip crowd back then, you know, it was one of the, let's see, it was too early to be a hippie, so I was a um, beatnik, I guess. Years later, they're in Baltimore in a jazz club, and her son is playing with him, and it's, it's just, what can you say, it's, it's nuts. Now, we've, we have some kind of a bond that it, it's, it's unexplainable, you know. Lenny was a victim of the war. He was a, a boy, you know, he wasn't uh, working as a guard in a concentration camp. So I never say that he's a Nazi. It's part of his past. It's something that you remark on. I mean, I'm, as a Jew, I, it doesn't bother me in the least. I, I just think that everyone's a victim when it comes to that kind of thing. So, no. And I don't think of it at all, honestly, because I'm a musician first, and Lenny's a musician, and we just relate in musical terms more than anything else. And then I love him as a person. We've become very close as friends, so there's that. But I, no, I don't think about that. 
In addition to their professional performances, Lenny, Michael, and bassist Steve Novosel volunteer at Washington and Lee High School, Lenny's alma mater. Lenny's jazz lessons often go beyond music. But our black friends couldn't play with us at the White Beaches. So we came through an era that you have probably no idea about, and I'm telling you that now, so maybe you think about that sometime, how fortunate you are to be able to sit here together and enjoy jazz music at Washington Lee that 55 years ago we couldn't do here. Lenny and his wife Renee returned to Germany as the nation marked the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II in May. It's sort of a piece of his history that wasn't completed. You know, it's like you've left something hanging and I felt like it would be nice to come full circle. Sixty years after the defeat of Hitler, the Germans are still coming to terms with their Nazi past. Holocaust memorials serve as reminders of the millions of Jews and other victims killed in concentration camps. Emotions about World War II, Hitler and the Holocaust were still fresh during events surrounding the 8th of May, a day that marks the official end of the war. Nazi connections are a sensitive issue. It's very difficult for other people that haven't had the experience or they don't have the background to see beyond that swastika. Against the backdrop of the anniversary, Lenny met with some former classmates from his music school days. The former music school students are now in their 70s and 80s. Some were doctors, lawyers, or musicians like Lenny. And like Lenny, they were nostalgic for a lost childhood. First of all, what moved me immensely was that music, you know, because it was the music that we performed and felt, and even at the time, sometimes it was hard work or drag. I'd, I didn't feel I was really belonging, and I never really did feel I belonged. I was put in there suddenly, you know. My brother stayed home and played in the mud, and I was suddenly in an elite music school, you know. Lenny's trip included a visit to his father's hometown of Wetzlar, north of Frankfurt, he visited places he remembered from his childhood. This is where I bought my first records. That store doesn't exist anymore. Now, now, here's the reason why. Because I can dance. I got hands in my pants. Oh, I can't. <laughs> that was my first jazz record. Oh, I can't dance. I got hands in my pants. I can't dance. I got hands in my pants. Lenny also stopped at the Jazz Institute in Darmstadt, south of Frankfurt. The archive is the third largest of its kind worldwide. Wolfram Nauer, the museum's director, explained the significance of Lenny's career in the context of post-war Germany. Well, he's this war generation, you know, who um, grew up during the war and after the war had this dream of that there must be something else. And he was one of the few people who actually fulfilled his dream to go to the States. I mean, nobody else did that. You know, people might have dreamt of this, but to actually do it, actually go over there and start anew and start, you know, at, z at point zero, that's really pretty much unheard of. Lenny's journey allowed him to reunite with old friends. It also brought back important, sometimes painful memories. When I hear that music, <coughs> that was probably the soul at that time, you know. And we sang and you, you start almost crying inside, you know, and you play this gorgeous Bach music, you know. Their soul, that's, you know, truth. And when I heard that, I said, despite of swastikas and uniforms and Nazi bonds and all, that music was, you know, that's the soul, yeah. But I'm flying home Wednesday when I go home, you know, and see, see my man Papa Fly and the old Croat, Steve Novosel, you know, and Pat. And the, the crowd is coming home, you know, Heim, Heim, Fritz is coming back and they'd be glad to see me. That, that's home, you know. And my little boy from New York, you know, Spiegel, a little Jewish boy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my family, it's my home, you know. And they'd be glad to see me again, and I'd be glad to see them again. Mm.
There's the Commission, Via's Commission. These are the prizes. And one of those is for Nate. Es ist mir eine Ehre und auch eine große Überraschung, hier zu sein. Und äh, ich danke erstmals allen. Und äh, ich sage mal, vor 50 Jahren hat endlich angefangen, sich Jazz zu spielen als Profi. Als ein Profi. Profi. Ein Profitler, nein. Geld habe ich noch keinen gemacht. Aber 50 Jahre spiele ich jetzt diese Musik. Bin ausgewandert als 17-Jähriger und äh, finde mich hier in Berlin. Danke zu Christina und meine Frau, die mich fit gehalten hat. Und, äh, sie hat mich hier nach Berlin gebracht. Und ich danke allen, das war eine große Überraschung, hätte ich nie gedacht, dass ich mal hier in Berlin bin. Und ich danke Ihnen und besonders Christina, die den Film gemacht hat. Danke Sie nochmal und ich danke Ihnen. <lacht> Musik hat sagt der in dem, am Ende Bach, das wäre für ihn wichtig, Soulmusik. <lacht>